Hi, this is Gina with Resplendent Daughter Ministries. It's so good to be with you today. Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your many, many blessings to us, including the tremendous blessing of getting to share your word together. As we look at what defines success today, please open our eyes so that we can see what your definition of success might be. In Jesus' name, amen. A few nights ago, I had insomnia, and oftentimes when I can't sleep, I run to the Word to meditate on the Scriptures for a while, and then I go back to bed and I try again. Um, I've blogged before about how prayer is often helpful, but... um, Reading the scriptures is is another great remedy for sleeplessness. So the other night, indeed, I had insomnia. I was very troubled, and uh, I found myself in Psalm 73. Although I read it from the message version that night, we're going to look at it in the NET today. So we're taking sort of a detour from Philippians and uh, diving into the Psalms a little bit. If I asked you to describe a successful person, what would you say? What are the adjectives that you would use? Let's consider what the world considers a successful person to be. Here are some of the attributes of worldly success in no particular order. Hiked the Grand Canyon. No, that was just kidding. No, that's not one of the attributes. I did go to the Grand Canyon, but in all honesty, I didn't really hike down in there, but I just got the t-shirt, okay? All right, so attributes of worldly success in no particular order. Financial wealth, power and influence, fame, I'm going to live forever, a certain generation will understand, couldn't resist, good looks, Many friends, loving family, hobbies, intelligence, significance. These worldly successes are not bad in and of themselves. Sometimes, often, though, people achieve success in the world's eyes by doing the following to achieve those desired outcomes that I just listed. For example, a live and let live attitude, a disregard of sin, theirs and others, situational ethics. We see this mentioned in verse 7 of the psalm, Psalm 73. The second thing is an attitude of, I'll use others however I please to get whatever I want. A lack of compassion. We see that in verse 5. Pride and arrogance. We see those in verses 3 and 6. Slander appears in verse 8. And rebellion and contempt toward God show up in verses 9 and 11 of Psalm 73. Yet, God often allows evil people to triumph over those whose motives are pure. Have you noticed that? If you're a person who longs to follow God, to please Him, to serve Him, the worldly successes of such people can be profoundly troubling. Yet, why does God allow evil people to be so successful in this life anyway? The psalmist, curiously enough, never answers that question because often in our specific personal situations, we don't get a precise answer either. That's aggravating sometimes, but sometimes God doesn't choose to answer that specific question for each one of us. But The more global answer is that God uses everything for his glory. Everything, which 
honestly is not much of a comfort when you're mired down, beaten down, seemingly squashed by troubles. What the psalmist does do here in Psalm 73 is to reframe. In verses 21 and 22, he rejects bitterness. He enters God's holy presence. We see that in verse 17. And he gets a clearer picture of the wicked. He sees that they're on a slippery slope. These people reach a point in their lives when they believe they have it made. And all of a sudden, God's judgment falls on them. Then, the psalmist shows us the number one characteristic of a person who is successful in God's eyes. What do you think it is? Do you remember what it was like as a young child to be held by your parent's hand and guided through a crowd? Perhaps it was at the carnival or at your large church through narrow hallways or at some other large gathering where there must have been many people packed close together. You trusted your parent to lead you the correct way and he or she must have you're here reading this after all, or watching this video. I think the number one characteristic of a person who is successful in God's eyes is humility, a willingness to allow one's own desires to become secondary to God's desires, a willingness to be led by Him. I promise if you think you've met a truly godly soul, he or she is humble. The older I get, the more convinced I am of this. What, for example, is the first step in accepting Jesus as Savior, accepting his offer of salvation? It's admitting that we're sinners who are unable to atone for our own transgressions, unable to save ourselves. Listen to the psalmist in verses 25 and 26. Whom do I have in heaven but you? I desire no one but you on earth. My flesh and my heart may grow weak, but God always protects my heart and gives me stability. The humble, successful disciple of Jesus Christ puts him first in his or her life. Arrogant and prideful people are unable to do this. Verse 23 and 24 say, But I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me by your wise advice, and then you will lead me to a position of honor. Do you see how the psalmist lives his life, walking resplendently with God? Everything is subordinate to God's will and the desire to live continually in God's presence. Such a humble soul is guided by God's wise advice, with God holding his or her hand. Such a person is at home with God in an ever-growing, ever-deepening relationship. What is this place of honor of which the psalmist speaks? It is eternity spent with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When this life ends, He still holds our hand and leads us into an eternity with Him. I believe it will feel so familiar to the one who has walked with God in this earthly life. I attended the funeral of a godly 92-year-old woman a few days ago. The musician at the funeral, my aunt, sang one of my favorite funeral songs. And I believe the content of this post is perfect 
for me to share the chorus with you. Pay attention to the last line especially. Just think of stepping on shore and finding it heaven. Of touching a hand and finding it God's. Of breathing new air and finding it celestial. Of waking up in glory and finding it home. Home is wherever Jesus is. It always has been. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us when we find ourselves overcome by perplexity at how things are playing out around us. We know that nothing is hidden from you, that nothing escapes your attention. Like a humble, trusting child holding the hand of its parent, may we walk hand in hand with you. May we be increasingly at home with you, both here on earth and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope this blog has blessed you today, and if it has, you can find more of these videos, these vlogs, these video logs, here at this YouTube channel. Please subscribe, and you can see my blog's address there on the screen. I welcome you to drop by, to spend a few minutes, to comment, to subscribe there as well. You can also contact me through Twitter at my Twitter handle on the screen. Thanks again for visiting.